Cuba uh, was one of the largest Spanish plantations in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and so you had millions of Africans enslaved in Cuba. And when the Cuban people fought the war against Spain to free themselves from Spain, the people who led that fight were the African Cubans. They were the majority of the army that fought to remove Spain. When they had defeated Spain and the war was over, the white-skinned Cubans backed by the Americans told the Africans, y'all need to go back in your place. You should go back to the status you were when you got out of slavery, which was a much different from slavery. So the African Cubans formed the first political party, black political party in the Western hemisphere. The white Cubans with American support decide that anybody who belonged to that political party, if you didn't disband and leave the party, you would be killed. And so they went on a killing spree in Cuba during that period of time at the turn of the 20th century that saw the death of 11 million Africans. Do y'all people hear me say that? Mm -hmm. And you've never heard of this. I know you've never heard of it because I never hear anybody talking about it. 11 million Africans were slaughtered at the hands of these white Cubans running around Miami, dancing about Fidel's death. Their grandparents murdered 11 million Africans. And so by the time we fast forward to 1959, and the start of the revolution, Fidel Castro father owned a big plantation, but in the area where the blackest population lived. So Fidel literally grew up with these black people. And as you know, Fidel has African blood as well. And he's acknowledged that he's African. And so when the revolution started, um, I think, what's the name of the city? San Jose, or San, San Jose where he's going to be buried this week in Oriente province, just outside, which was the blackest province in Cuba. And so once Fidel had launched that war, it was against the Americans who owned the majority of the best land in Cuba and controlled the majority of the business in Cuba, American corporations, American agriculture corporations, um, the casinos. Cuba was at that point what Las Vegas is today. Mm -hmm. Yet the Cuban people weren't profiting from it. So this was the hangout of Mario Lansky, Lucky Luciano, Bugsy Siegel. Cuba was their spot. But mm -hmm. Fidel came and took all that from them. Because see, if people don't understand what happened, they don't know what the fuss is about. He took all the casinos and all the millions and millions of dollars from these folks. Okay? And so he took all of that land from the American corporations and closed those corporations down and drove them out of his country. Those who wanted to stay and work with them, he was willing to let them stay. So he came to America before he ever went to Russia, told America he wanted to build a democracy, but it had to be a democracy based on social justice. Well, since America is a racist country who wasn't providing the blacks here social justice, they weren't going to support Fidel Castro and his revolution to provide social justice in Cuba. So America would not support Fidel and the revolution. They wanted Fidel to give the, the casino back to the mafia, give the land back to the exploiting racist corporations, and Fidel said no. So he turned to the Soviet Union as a last resort. And Russia says, yes, we'll help you develop financial. And America at that point carried out a number of assassination attempts which failed. Then they tried an invasion called the Bay of Pig, which failed. Fidel wiped them out. And then they went into this heavy boycott. For over 50 years, they put an economic boycott around that island. And then you're talking about poverty. If it wasn't for your boycott, there would be no poverty in Cuba. Mm -hmm. you know? And those white land-owning families who escaped to Miami and to Union, New Jersey, they're the descendants of those people who murdered the 11 million Africans. Mm, that's why they happy. You see? Yes. So we need to understand history. Malcolm said history is best. Qualify. Qualify you for all research. 
And so once you begin to understand history and understand why they're so angry with Fidel Castro, because Fidel took their Las Vegas from them. Fidel took their agricultural conglomerates, one of the biggest in the Caribbean, from the American Black um, Farming Corporation, farming for bananas and tobacco in Cuba, using African slave labor to do it. Fidel took all of that away. And then he went a step further. At the same time, around the same time, America murders Patrice Lumumba, who were trying to bring freedom and independence and democracy to the Congo. <clears throat> America have now admitted that they murdered Patrice Lumumba a few years ago. Formally admitted they murdered Patrice Lumumba. Well, Fidel Castro sent the Cuban army, led by Ernesto Che Guevara, into the Congo to lead those guerrillas of the fallen leader, Patrice Lumumba. Let's talk about the important role of Fidel, I mean, of, um, uh, right, I'm coming into that. Yeah, the brother you just right. spoke about, Che Guevara. Che Guevara. But Che Guevara was from Bolivia. He was a medical doctor who chose to pick up the gun and fight the revolution on the side of the Cuban people to help and free them from American imperialism and domination. He would later die, of course, in Bolivia when the Soviet Union would betray him to the American CIA. Right. But before we get to that, let's come back and watch Che Guevara in Africa, in the Congo, leading the troops of Patrice Lumumba and with Cuban troops and advisors with him, fighting against American, Belgian, and French troops and the Negro lackeys they had under the Bimbe and, and, and Kasabubu or whatever his name, Masabubu, whatever they had down in the Congo. So America used the fact that Cuba sent this army to the Congo to go and bomb the Congo in the 1960s, early 60s. And most people don't know much about America bombing the Congo, killing hundreds of thousands of African people in Congo mm. under the guise that they were going to save 10 Catholic nuns that was being held hostage. Same old game they use today. But Fidel didn't stop there. When they left the Congo, Cuba would send his army back into Africa multiple times. Had it not been for the army of Cuba, under the leadership of Fidel Castro and his brother Raul, who was maybe more tougher than Fidel militarily, because Fidel was the political leader, but Raul was the military leader after the revolution. Fidel was the military leader during the revolution. And so Cuba sent this army into Africa, into Angola, into um, um, what do you call the area, Mozambique. And they took on the army of South Africa. It was Fidel's army defeating and breaking the back of the South African troops that allowed for Nelson Mandela to be free from prison and the ANC to take over the government in South, South Africa. That was a direct result of the defeat of the South African military by the army of Cuba. But it goes further than that. Namibia, Southwest Africa, Namibia, got its freedom as a direct result of the Cuban army defeating the South Africans and the white cracker army that was fighting against SWAPO, who was the liberation force for the Namibian people. So Namibia gets its freedom because of the army of Cuba. Not only the army, they send medical personnel and they send technical personnel. They send engineering personnel to help rebuild Angola with MPLA. That's the Liberation Party in Angola, MPLA, who was fighting the Portuguese. The Portuguese army was crushed by the army of Fidel Castro. People don't know about this. The Cuban army, when the Barbara Walters interviewed Fidel around back in the 60s and asked, why, or early 70s, why are you sending your troops to Africa? He says, our brothers and sisters are going home to fight for the freedom of their brothers and sisters. But Cuba did more than that. It sent the army, which was enough. It sent this medical corps, which was enough. 
it defeated Portugal. It defeated South African army. It defeated the Americans who were secretly in there fighting beside the South Africans. And it freed Angola. And it freed Namibia. And it freed South Africa and caused the apartheid regime in South Africa to fold up tent and pull back into the, the, the rural areas. But they went further. Every African nation that was fighting against colonialism and imperialism, Fidel Castro took their students and the, off of Cuba is a place called the Isle of Palms. And he built a whole university complex there just to train Africans to go back home and be engineers and to be doctors and to be other types of technicians. He did that to be school teachers. In Cuba, for decades, this is going on. Right now, there's at least 100 plus African American and African Latinos from America studying medicine in Cuba for free. And this has been going on for decades. So Fidel Castro's role as an African man and helping African people in crisis against colonialism and imperialism is unmatched by anyone in this hemisphere. I would say today Fidel Castro is one of the greatest revolutionaries that have ever lived, bar none. One of the greatest revolutionaries that has ever lived. He was one of the greatest Africans because he took his army and sent it from the Caribbean into Africa and broke the back of imperialism in Africa. He defeated the American forces in Southern Africa. He defeated the, the, the German forces in Namibia. He defeated the Portuguese forces in Angola. And he defeated the army of South Africa, which was assisting in all those areas, which caused the fall of the South African military and why they had to let Nelson Mandela out of prison and turn South Africa over to the ANC. So when we think of Fidel and these people who down they call themselves celebrating their birth, this as America have put this boycott around that nation for 50 years and said, well, we're doing it because they're Marxists. Cuba has always had a mixed economy, a socialist economy and a capitalist economy that has never had strictly a Marxist economy. And people don't understand enough about economics, they need to pay attention. Except what they did was put a cap on profit. So you can make profit, but you're not going to make profit to the point you're going to exploit the masses of our people. You see? And so we need to study this man, and we need to study his friend, Ernesto J. Guevara, um, and the sacrifice they made to help their brothers and sisters and to help their own countrymen get freedom from imperialism. Uh, what was the meeting between Fidel Castro and Malcolm X about? And where were you at that time? Because I know you was, was you a security for Malcolm or was no, you? I was security for Malcolm X's assistant. Okay, for his assistant. His sister. Oh, okay. So um, what was that meeting like? What was it about? Was you present? Where were you at that time when Fidel came to Harlem and they met at the Teresa Hotel on the 125th Street? What was that like, brother? No, I wasn't there. I've only heard about it. Rodnell was the only one that's still living that was there. Okay. Rodnell is Malcolm's nephew, his sister Ella's son. Right. And most people, including Rodnell and them, were not in the room where the private meeting took place. Okay. Um, so they only know what Malcolm tells them after he comes out of the meeting. But what was extraordinary about the meeting was, first of all, the white hotels downtown would not entertain this African leader this revolutionary from the Caribbean. And so he chose to come to Harlem instead of making compromises with them. And he came to the Teresa Hotel with his entourage. And he met a number of persons while he was there. And one of the main characters that he's meeting with is Malcolm X. And this is at a time, you know, when Malcolm X was growing in influence in the black community as the minister of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the nation of Islam. And it was one of the most powerful force in Northeastern America and in Midwest and Western America. We think of Dr. King and the civil rights movement, but that was mainly confined to eight or nine states in the South. The rest of the nation, Malcolm X reigned supreme. And most people don't think of that because the white media don't point to that. And so Fidel and Malcolm was talking about 
where do you go with revolution? Malcolm was serious about overthrowing the government of the United States if it came to that, or pushing them to the point that they gave us our freedom so that we can do what he said black nationalism was, control the economic politics and culture in the communities where we live. And if that meant picking up guns to do it, so be it. That's why Malcolm says the price of freedom is death. And he was clear about that and he proved it with his own life. And so his meeting with Fidel actually bolstered him in the eyes of revolutionaries around the world. And it also put a target more on his back from the Americans because they said if he gets support from Fidel, and they know Fidel had the capability of giving any kind of support, financial support, military support, intelligence support, because we didn't have an intelligence apparatus to know what was going on inside of the American government we live here. But Cuba had an intelligence apparatus that functioned within the American government that could give Malcolm the kind of intelligence information he needed about imperialism <clears throat> around the world. And so that was a big part of the meeting. But the biggest part of the meeting was to show solidarity between the revolutionary people of Cuba and the revolutionary people of the United States who was aspiring to free themselves from white domination and white supremacy in North America. Mm -hmm. Okay, now um, I asked everybody this mm -hmm. to see what they would say. Mm -hmm. Now that we have Trump for the first four years, mm -hmm. do you feel a certain type of way about Cuba now? Because we know that Trump said live and for the world, he's going after Robert Mugabe. He tired of seeing Robert Mugabe turned them crackers away, taking away property and giving it to the indigenous Africans that's there. So, but um, so Trump is like, yo, the first thing I'm gonna do is is go ahead and uh, you know attack so, Zimbabwe. So I'm asking you, so I'm do you have any fear now for no. Cuba that Trump is there? No. What can we expect from this fool? Nothing. <laughs> See, what, what you got to know is the difference between reality and illusion. Okay. Um, Trump is an illusion. America is not run by the president. It's run by the oligarchs, the 1% of which families. They run America no matter which party and or which Hold on. Is. Say that once more and please say it clear so that people can hear you. America is not really ran by. America He's is just not the... run by any presidents. They're nothing but managers. Okay. They manage the the enterprise of the corporate oligarchs. You've got rich families, the DuPonts, the Morgans, the Vanderbilts, the Pierpoints, the Rockefellers. These are the people that run America. These are all the Catholics, oligarchs. The, um, the Pope? The Pope don't run America. The Pope is at odds with the people that run America. Okay. America is primarily run by white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. But their main managers have been the Zionist Jews. But what has happened lately, the Jews have bitten off more than they can chew. They tried to take over the house. Hillary was their main man. First, it was Obama. Obama was a Jewish president. Mm. And he put forth an agenda that they had. That whole homosexual thing is a Zionist agenda. It is a weapon to use to break down other communities, especially the black community. So Obama did more for the LGBT, whatever that community is, is called, than anybody in the history of America. Ooh. And he did less for black people than Ronald Reagan or Richard Nixon. So we need to look at history and see. George Bush did more for black folks than um, this young man. But again, the president, he could have done more despite just being a manager. But you have to have guts. You have to have courage. You can't be pretending with a good speech that you got it going on, okay? I said, let me, Barack, let me finish get, your question. Get. What I want people to understand is that that, people, that group they referred to as the 1%, this 1% at its leadership core is a group of oligarch. Oligarchs mean wealthy families that own the majority of shares in most of the corporate and banking structure of America. They rule America. When Trump, you see, he's interviewing these people for his cabinet. He will take in his cabinet who he's told to take in the cabinet. You see the people he's appointing, he will appoint who he's told to appoint mm -hmm. by those oligarchs and their representative. Anything short of that, you get what the Kennedy boys get, coup de tête. 
All yes. Right? They not only did it to John, they did it to Bobby, and they did it to John's son to let them know you will not bring the Catholic Church into a ruling position in the American power structure, you see. Because the Catholic Church is not a church at all. And we need to be clear so people can understand this. Catholic Church is a nation state that operates as Vatican City. Vatican City has its own currency. It has an ambassador that it sends to all other nations. And all nations send an ambassador to Vatican City. Now, all of the land that the Catholic that own around the world is contiguous and considered to be one nation. So the Catholics are the largest nation in the world in terms of ownership of land mass. But we don't think about that that way because nobody tells us that that way. They, they are a nation. The religion is a secondary thing. You see, religion is simply how they organize and rule the masses that make up their nation. And that's their ideology. Christianity is their ideology, just like capitalism is America's ideology. You know what I'm saying? Socialism is the Chinese ideology. And so in America, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant and the Germanics rule. The largest ethnic group in America is Germans. The second largest ethnic group in America is African-Americans. The third largest group in America is Latinos from Central South America and Mexico. And the fourth group is white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. The Jews who wield so much power is near the very bottom of the rock, but they've been able to use the African-American numbers as a uh, as pawns and an army for Zionist interests since the 1913, ever since they took over and destroyed the Niagara movement and created the NACP. So we need to just study history. And a good book, I like to tell people about books when I'm talking, is one called, it's written by a brother named Dr. Harold Cruz, who's an ancestor now one of our great historians who we don't know about because white folks beat him down. And he taught at Columbia University and the book is called Plural But Equal. Get that book, Plural But Equal by Dr. Harold Cruz. And he had another book and that book is called The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. We still have a crisis with the Negro intellectual. <laughs> and so those two books yes. will open your eyes to a lot of what I'm saying. And we know that Minister Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam Historical Division have published two books on black Jewish relationship. Get those two books. And the third one is called Broken Alliance, Turbulent Times Between Blacks and Jews by a guy named Jonathan Kaufman, who used to be the head of the Boston Globe. And if I came and I did a television show around the time that he came up with that book in the 80s. And when he came up with that books, showing the real relationship between blacks and Jews and how we were being used by them and misused by them, he was fired the next week as the editor of the Boston Globe. And so we need to study history so we can know what's up. They will understand how great Fidel Castro really was when you see the things he did for African peoples, not just on the continent of Africa, but look at the things he did in Bolivia. Look at the things he did in Venezuela. Look at the things he did for the African community in Colombia. Fidel Castro and the Cuban people, despite being forced into a poverty by the American boycott, still was able to assist and aid other people in their revolutionary fight all over the Caribbean and all over Africa. And so we love you, uh, Commander Fidel. And we know that the divine and the ancestors have taken you in their arms now. And your spirit will forever be with us because you were the greatest revolutionary that ever lived. And at 90 years, they can dance about your death, but you lived 90 years, brother. But all of those attempts by the CIA to kill you, you thwarted them. Mm -hmm. You lived 90 years and never disrespected your people. You lived 90 years and never betrayed your revolution and never sold out. That's what makes you the greatest revolutionary that ever lived. But it confuses people when they see a group of people that fled from Cuba, where, where he opened up and said, all right, y'all can go. Those who want to go, go. Because now I'm looking at the TV, I'm looking at the news, and I see them with their hands in the air saying, yes, he's dead, he's dead. It makes Fidel look like a bad guy. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, so we need to really know who these people are, no, the one that's doing that. The descendants of the people that murdered 
at the turn of the 20th yes, you century, said that. 11 million Africans. That's enough. Damn. That they murdered 11 million Africans mm. to have their little business and hotel and their partnership with the white corporations and the white agricultural uh, uh, conglomerates that was planting fruits, bananas, plantains, tobacco, and shipping it back here to America. They were the pimps and the hustlers in the casinos, all the casinos of the Cosa Nostra, Lucky Luciano, and the Jewish mafia, Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel. And when Castro took all that from them, they ran to come to their mammies and their bosses, white mammies and bosses in America. Mm -hmm. And they deserve what they get. And I know the Cuban revolution, even Raul is much tougher than Fidel, much tougher than Fidel. So, you know? so by, by ending saying that Raul is much tougher than Fidel, Assad Shakur is still safe. Assad is Shakur is safe. Okay. Cuba will never betray Assad. But it isn't just Assad there. Right. I have another comrade right. there. There are others there whom I don't know. But I have another comrade who I fought in the streets with. Me and him went to bloody physical battles together against white folks. His name is El Lobo, William Morales, Willie Morales from East Harlem, who was the founder of FALN, F A L N, the Front for the National Liberation of Puerto Rico. He lost all of his finger in a bombing factory, mm -hmm. but he still had his thumbs. And he managed, like Asada, to escape from federal custody. All right? <laughs> and now, hey, El Lobo, you know, you know we love you. He's in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And so is Asada. And Cuba will never betray them. Never betray them. Even Raul, who's 80, if Raul was to pass the day, the Politburo in Cuba and the government of Cuba will never betray the revolution. They've proven it. 50 years stand up against the most powerful political instrument in the world, uh, stand against the most powerful economic instrument in the world, and Cuba never bowed, not once. Mm, that's a lot, baby. One man can't do that. A people does that. So they're trying to pretend it's one man. But Fidel have been out of government for a decade or more, and nothing has changed. And when Raul go, Cuba will elect another one of its young leaders, and Cuba will go on. And if they think they're going to betray that revolution, they got the wrong thought coming. Because this is the longest sustained revolution in the history of the world that did not compromise or violate its principles and its integrity. Yes, I was watching um, the news last night, and of course they showed Donald Trump. And Trump said he hoped Barack Obama <laughs> does not go over there for the funeral somewhat like bigging him up like you know giving him praises and trump bigging him up nothing. trump me, don't want to see that let me tell you something about trump let's not big up trump he's a punk i don't care if the president of the united states it means nothing 43 of the 44 of the 45 presidents of the united states before him were cracker racist white clan clansman type men so what's new? We got caught in some illusion about Obama. Obama behaved in terms of policy in the same way those other 43 behave. What's wrong with black folks? Get out of the illusion that the Jewish media have put you in. They convinced you that this little half-baked lesbian who murdered um, uh, Muammar Gaddafi and threw Africa back at least 20, 30 years called Hillary was worthy of being your leader and many of us ran behind this thing like it was something worth having. Please, black folks, mm -hmm. wake up and be free. To beat them and, you know, secret to life is to have no fear. Secret to life is to have no fear, you know. And as Desilene told us, it's got to be about freedom or death. And we kind of lose our way because we're not studying our history and we're not listening to our people. We're not listening to our ancestors. We pour libation, but it's meaningless. No. Libation got to have a meaning. It means you got to know your ancestors, the poor libation. Don't no call the name of, of Harriet Tubman if you've never read nothing about Harriet. People always get upset, Professor, because I always mention Asada Shakur. There's a reason why I do that, Professor. I mention her because there's so many young people that don't even know who she is. So by me mentioning Asada Shakur, that gives the other young people like Asada, who is Asada's core? So when they see it, see, they don't even know. I named my daughter 
after Asada Shakur. Mm-hmm. Her name is Africa Asada. Well, let me tell you who and, Asada Shakur is. Go ahead, brother. Go Asada in on that. When we were teenagers. Because they scared when I mentioned her name. I don't know why. Asada, we, we were teenagers together. Asada was the wife, the wife of my best friend. His name was Zaid Shakur, mm-hmm. the uncle of Tupac Shakur, and the brother of Lumumba Shakur, and of, um, oh, Lord, what's his other, his middle brother, who was in the prison, the one who raised Tupac from the Black Liberation Army. Asada and Zaid were like twins. Zaid Shakur was the captain of the Bronx Black Panther Party headquarters. His brother Lumumba Shakur was the captain of the Harlem Black Panther Party headquarters. When the Panther 21, there's a, a, you can go online and look up the Panther 21. 21 members of the Black Panther Party was indicted in New York and brought to trial. And the only one that didn't surrender was the husband of Asada Shakur, Zaid Shakur. That led to a shootout on the Jersey Turnpike where Zaid was assassinated by New Jersey troopers. And one of those troopers was purported to have been assassinated or killed in self-defense by Sister Asada Shakur. They also shot Sister Asada in her arm, and they shot another brother who was with him. Asada was tried and arrested, even though it was proven that there was no way she could have pulled the trigger of a gun, given the damage to her arm. But they sent and set to prison anyway. And some revolutionary comrades went in the prison and broke Sister Asada Shakur out. She was eight months pregnant, at the time and she was allowed to live freely in Harlem under the protection of the Black Liberation Army until she had her baby and then she was transported to Cuba under the protection of Fidel Castro and the Cuban Revolution where she's at until this day. She was a teenager, a college student at Hunter College of New York at the time all of this happened. Mm. She was a revolutionary of the top order as a teenage girl, passing out flyers, picketing, doing all the things some of you young people are doing now with Black Lives Matter and other things that you're out there doing, red, black, and green. So you're in the good stead, you're on the right path, and there will be no way Asada Shakur and Willie Morales are the only two persons who ever escape a federal penitentiary and they've never been able to get them back. That's why they're angry about the fugitive in Cuba. Those are the two persons they're talking about. And long live the Cuban Revolution, and long live Sister Asada, and long live El Lobo, Willie. Hey, it's always been about the two of you, freedom and death. Both of you prove it with your life. You were willing to die for this revolution, and the ancestors and the divine spared you thanks to the help of Fidel and the Cuban Revolution. So please, sisters and brothers, respect Asada Shakur. She's not an Angela Davis. She's not a fake revolutionary. She's the real deal. <laughs> I'm not gonna say no more about that. That's right, my brother. Um, can Barack Obama make up some ground and grant clemency to Mumia Abu Jamal before he finally he leaves could if the he office? Had the to do if it. he had the guts, I was saying. But it isn't just Mumia. We got fifty. Right, we got so many of them. Right. Uh, and Matulu Shakur. Matulu Shakur, who's the, bro- the brother-in-law of Asada Shakur. Right. Okay. Um, Matulu, who was a leader of the Black Liberation Army, and who was a medical doctor to, mm-hmm. on top of that, who had come up with a cure for heroin using acupuncture. That's mm-hmm. why they went after Matulu. He worked at Lincoln Hospital right across the bridge right here. So, no, we've got a lot of comrades. Some have died behind those bars who should never have been in the first place but should have been released when their parole time came up. But they came up for parole one, two, three, four, five times or more, and the white police and the judges and others would go to court and make sure they couldn't get parole. So if Obama had any kind of testicles to talk about, if he had any kind of decency, if he had any kind of manhood that would make political sense, he would grant clemency to all of those brothers and sisters, including the man. But we know he doesn't have it because he works for somebody. And he's making sure that he'll be able to have his speaking engagements when he leaves the presidency. And him and his wife will be able to make their millions and live comfortably watching the oppression of their people continue and then realizing how little they did when they had an opportunity to do much. 
So he's not significant enough for much more discussion. Let's go and discuss something else. Right, right, brother. Um, I remember listening to Phil Valentine maybe about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And Dao, brother Dao. And Dao made the statement that it was the Pope who runs all of this shit. I think Phil was saying, no, the Pope is, he's, um, he sits on the throne of Rome. But um, Dao said, no, he runs all of this shit. No, he doesn't. Talk about the, the role of the Pope. Yeah, but I don't want to get that deep into that. Like, okay. <laughs> well, I tried to outline it before. That's why you got to study history. And then you don't deal with cliche and misunderstanding. Vatican City is a nation state, just like America just like Britain, just like France. That's the first thing you gotta understand, mm -hmm. if you're gonna understand the power of the Pope. Every piece of land, church, school, whatever, that the Vatican owns around the world is a part of the contiguous Vatican nation state, which makes them the largest geographical country on earth. Now, is that sinking in? Do you understand what I just said there? And then now, when you fold in to the, the nearly billion Catholics, they are the citizens of that nation. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. Meaning, and then wherever they have a Catholic school, they're training ideologically the leaders and the representative of that nation. And so you got a group in the Catholic Church called the Jesuits. Who are the Jesuits? They are the military arm of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. In the same way, the FOI, the fruit of Islam, is the military arm of the nation of Islam. The Jesuits is the military arm of the Catholic Church. And then you got another aspect of the Catholic Church. And you can look this up online. It's called the Black Pope. His skin is not black, but this is a secret society. This is their CIA. You understand? This is their secret network that has this tentacle and every government around the world influencing it. And right here in the state of New York, New York City had been controlled by the Irish, the Jews, and to some degree by the Italian when they opened up and let Giuliani get in there. And now you've got this guy who's the mayor. But Albany is controlled by the Catholic Church. And if you look at every governor as far back as you can see, they're all Catholic, including David Patterson. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some people say, oh, the Italians control. No, the Italians don't control Albany. The Catholic Church control Albany. What does that mean? It means they control the billions of dollars in tax revenue that comes from the pocket of the citizens of the state of New York. And those tax revenue then is divided <coughs> in a way and contracts <coughs> is given in a way so that their population gets the lion's share of that wealth. And decisions are made to protect their interests in terms of legislatively in, in the state of New York. So that's how you're gonna to have to study this thing. But in terms of who runs America, America is run by the group of oligarchs that I told you about, who is predominantly white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, and Germans. From the Vanderbilts to the Morgans, from the Pier Points to the Rockefellers and more. Those are the families who control the wealth by controlling the stocks in most of the banks and most of the major corporations of North America. Those family further control the Federal Reserve. Those banks that control the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve is not a government agency. It is a private banking agency controlled by couple of German banks, um, a British bank, and the rest is American, Anglo-Saxon, Germanic banks. And they determine how the wealth and the capital of America that is generated by this government is used and in whose interest legislation is made in Washington, D.C. Now, they'll give some play to the poor cracker and give them some legislation that give them some power because they're, they're, they're stormtroopers and they need to keep them pacified and satisfied. But make no bones about who rule America. And I'll go back over it again. The largest ethnic group in America is Germans. 
The second largest ethnic group is African American. The bulk of the German live in the Midwest. The bulk of the African Americans live in the South, Southeast across the Texas. Mm -hmm. Now work with that equation and okay. you begin to gain some understanding of what's really going on in America. All right. Um, you got 800 people viewing you right now without even no promotion or nothing like that. They watching oh, and um, they watching you. They love it. They giving you mad props in the comment. They say, oh, we got the father in the building. So they definitely loving what you got to say, thank brother. those people who voted for me in the Black Power Awards. That's right. Um, That's right. I heard there were 7,000 nominees and there was 13 categories with three people in category each. And I won the one for historian. And I know I did that because of the young black people who listened to me. Mm -hmm. So, like, I think who was it? Uh, Minister Farrakhan said the other night when people asked, why do you do what you do? He said, because I'm in love with you, mm -hmm. uh, meaning the black people. Um, I do what I do because I'm in love with my people. There Dr. you go. Dr. Nobles said it before when somebody said, uh, oh, y'all romanticize Africa too much. Well, Dr. Nobles says, if you love somebody, you have a romance with them. Mm -hmm. So if you love your people, I love my people. And so... I'm always having a romance with them. I will always romanticize you. There you because go. Because you are worthy of that. That's and right. We are the parent people of the world. We are the first creation. When God decided to become man, God decided to first become a black woman. And she created everything else. And you can't prove nothing contrary to that. Okay. Nor can you prove that we, the black people, are God having a human experience. Yes, Our sir. problem is through the crisis and the the brutality we faced against the sick white person and these Asiatic people, we have lost our memory of how to be the God having the human experience. You know, that's what Allah was trying to tell us when he when he founded the five percent nation. But even many of those brothers didn't understand the teachings of the brother um, back then. You know, but we just have to keep struggling. It's even over here in North America when we talk about the first nation, we talk about the Asiatic. First Nation, but there was a black First Nation before the Asiatic Native American came here. And before we met the white man, we were at war with the Asiatic uh, light skinned people who we now call First Nation. No, I'm First Nation. Right. They're the Second Nation. I love them. They're my brothers and my sisters. But let's be clear about history. I'm from the Chicora Nation and the Tuscarora and Waccamaw Nation. And we were black. Now, some of our Moorish brothers and sisters said we were Moors. I don't care what the label is. I know we's the black brown people and we were here before the Asiatic long hair native people came. And so if we get history straight, we won't have no problem with defending our shit wherever we are. Mm -hmm. Now that Trump, I know you don't like dealing with but this. But there's a brother who wrote a good book on this name, brother Imhotep, what's my Michael Imhotep, not Michael. Um, oh, but brother Imhotep, I've written a book and you need to go look it up on the Africans who were here before the light-skinned Native Americans came. Mm. Now that Trump is linking up with Giuliani, mm. do you see the rise of police brutality in the community, in the hood, so to speak, quote it unquote? It get no worse than it is, and it's no worse than it ever was. While we, we were fighting against the same police brutality in the 60s, that's what the whole Panther Party was about. Right. If you study the history of the Black Panther Party, the first incident that occurs in the party, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale is following the police of Oakland around, filming them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that they, they were using the, the filming of the police as a way. Of course, we didn't have the phone camera then. We didn't have all of the technology we have now. So they were walking around with an actual eight millimeter. And um, the cops moved on them. And so one cop shot Huey. And Huey went down. See, there's two, Huey was standing between two cops, right? <laughs> Nobody has told the real story, right? Huey gets shot in the belly. Huey goes down. The cop that was supposed to shoot him in the back shoots the other cop. Ah! Oh. The one they charged Huey with shooting. Huey didn't have no gun. Huey had a law book, quoting from the law book. He didn't have no weapon. So the cop shot the cop. The cop and they tried him. to blame it on Huey. Right. But somebody else who was there, whose name I'm not going to call because he got away, he shoots the other cop. <laughs> All right. Okay. But that didn't fit their scenario, so they had to create the scenario of Huey shooting the cop. Right. But Huey didn't shoot nobody. He mm. was reading out the law book. Look at that. You know? But 
the point of it all is that the Black Panther Party came into being to try and thwart police brutality of that day. The police department is an extension of the poor European immigrants, primarily Irishmen, who was the white Negroes of the day, I don't want to use the other word. Uh, and so they have never stopped being what they were. They were hired to track down and kill black people who wanted to be free. And that group have morphed into what we call police department. What's wrong with this whole picture is that we are not fighting to become the police. I remember when I was teaching at City College. Uh -oh, you, City I think College. you said something crazy. No, they're they, they going to say, what Small's talking about? We yeah, should be the police. We're going to use any common sense. And you I understand what you're talking about. You got to have police, then you be the police. Go ahead. Unless you just enjoy getting the shoot down so you can complain about it. Well, if you want to change that dynamics, take that shit over. That's as simple as that. And you can't just take it over by saying, I'm going to take it over. Because when we try to move on the New York City Police Department in the 60s and start taking it over, at that time, you had to be six foot tall mm -hmm. and something, something, something. And so we won the right to be policemen. And so they changed the, the height and brought it down to five foot something. So now they can bring white women in and other so called minorities in and never really increasing the number significantly of black folks. Okay. But we could still beat them in the communities we live in where we have to organize ourselves and we have to take young black men and women and give them dummy tests. And because we can get a copy of these old tests, you can buy these civil service books and let them learn how to take these tests and get them in physical shape. You know, go to the gym and train and send that cadre to take those tests and follow them to make sure nobody discriminates against them. And we need to do that over and over until we get as many of our people on these police departments as we can. But we need to have them organized before we get to the police department. Uh oh, here go my second guest. I think he's ready. I don't know. That ain't nobody. That's an unknown caller. Okay. Um, beautiful, 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 brother. You going in? So now we leading up to this December. Well, let me just make we're, we're go ahead. That piece, but go ahead, brother. brother. Malcolm yeah. X told us to be clear about that. Malcolm X said, "Black nationalism is controlling the economic, politics, and culture where you live." Malcolm X says that you've got to be the police, the fireman, and the school teacher in the community you live. That's what he said. So we've got to come up with the strategies to do that. And we need to have an economic strategy. We shouldn't buy, shop for nobody. I don't even care if they're skin black. If they do not put their money back in our community, if they do not hire our local people, shut them down. And the best way to shut them down is don't shop there no more. Mm -hmm. And, and right. they'll sell that store to you on the cheap. <laughs> so we have to be serious about self-love. And let me tell you one other thing before we move on yeah, to the next yeah. topic. In the last month, you know, the divine teaches you in a lot of different ways. You know, I've been meeting these sisters who are suffering some of the greatest trauma at the hands of brothers. And this shit has got to stop. We have got to stop abusing our women and we have got to stop abusing our girl children. I have not met a woman in the last six months, and I've been deliberately carrying out these interviews, that wasn't molested or raped starting when they were a child, Damn. and mostly by black men and by people in their own damn families. So this shit has got to be cut off. You know, I mean, it's so hideous. I met one beautiful sister, and and and, uh, and I'm a flirt. I like to flirt with sisters. I enjoy it and have fun, but I know where the line is. I know how to be a brother. Right. I know how to be a friend. And me and sister was talking. And while we were trying to charge our phones and she went on the plane, she was a, a sister who was a, a Muslim sister. And so when we got on the plane, I ended up sitting right beside her. So we started talking and she told me her history. And I had to cry through most of that trip mm. when I heard my sister's history. She left the dude who she was with. You know, I won't even say what denomination because I don't want that to be right. He, he wasn't a Muslim, he's from another one of our denominations. And she came back to America. And then she found solace and protection under the nation of Islam and Minister Farrakhan. And thank God, because as much as we sometimes beat up on the ministers, many of those brothers and sisters in the nation have learned how to protect our sisters. 
but brothers across this world, keep your hands off of your woman. Stop sexually abusing your woman. And some of you are sexually abusing your own wives. Stop it. If you truly believe that you're a man and that you made in the image of the divine, then act like God. And then treat the woman like she's a goddess. You treat her like she's a goddess, she'll treat you like you're a god. Stop mimicking the white man on the plantation doing slavery. And start acting like a black man that hadn't been punkified by the white man. Because our sisters are hurting, man. They're hurting across this country, across the world, really, because I find the same mess in Africa. They're hurting. We offer them no protection. We don't even give them psychological protection. We're not giving them emotional protection. And we're certainly not giving them physical protection. So I just wanted to get that out. I want people to know how I feel about that. Right. And I concur, brother. I support what you're saying on that. Um, now we're about to embark on December the 18th coming up with the general, Sarah Sutton Seti. This right here now. I don't know if you heard about it. Have you heard about it? Yeah, I've heard about me, okay. me and Seti doing stuff on April 1st down the <laughs> Check this out, though. We got Sarah Sutton Seti, mm -hmm. who is now saying, who come up under Aswa Kwesi, mm -hmm. who've been studying Dr. Ben. He is now coming out saying that the metal netta has not been deciphered. He's going up against your crew, who you love. You love both of these well, brothers. Hold on. That's what I said. Love you love both of these brothers. He's going up against Unk um, in the Armin Ross squad. And then we got, oh, yeah, there you go. And then he got, now, Pharaoh, see, we doing this, it's like the brothers is building. It ain't like we I hate each other. Down they, in Atlanta, we got to meet for the first yeah, time. Yeah, Pharaoh was so. just here in Harlem this weekend. He just broke out. So now you got Seti and Pharaoh linking up together to go up against the Armin Ross squad to bring the people It's going to be some, a heck of a debate. <laughs> to bring the people some powerful information. Uh -huh. Um, what do you think? What do you say to that when you hear people say the metal nether has not been deciphered? But then you got Seti who came up on the Oswa crazy, and then Dr. Ben and all the brothers. Well, see, I'll be prejudicing if I answer that question. Okay. So okay. What, I, what I'm going to say to the people, I, I haven't talked to Seti. We had a brief conversation. I think it was here with you. Right. Um, but I need to give him a call. I did talk to Ankh and some of the squad, the Amara squad. Um, I know this is going to be a, a hell of a debate. Right. <laughs> um, I spoke to Lil Farrell a little bit while we were down at the Black Power Awards. Um, there, there, there is room for both sides' case. Uh -huh. And that's the best I'd do with that because anything else would be right, violating right. I got um, the, the spirit of what they have to do. But I think both of them got a good position. I would just like to see how they defend those positions with their research. I know Seti is a hell of a good researcher, but the squad is also a hell of a good researcher. Um, both of them presents well, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. I plan to be out of town, but I'm not going to South Carolina until after the debate. I got to be here on the 18th. Wow, I'm that's going to be good. I'm going to reserve a seat for you, brother, no, right in the front. You know, um, it's, it's an important question. Because you know, Dr. Ben had said once, and I'm not even throw that right there. There you go. <laughs> so, there you go. <laughs> but I just tell the brothers and sisters of all the debates I've seen had, I think this one is going to be one of the most informative because I know the position of both of the brothers, mm -hmm. and I know some of the information both of them are bringing forward, both of the groups are bringing forward, and so information coming from both directions is going to be enlightening and informative and we are all going to learn some new stuff about Kemet and some new stuff about Medunetia and we're going to learn some new stuff about linguistics. Right. That's what's going to blow your mind. Right. Now I'm privy to hand a little bit of this and that and this so I can't talk about nothing other than say this is worth tuning in. This is worth hanging out. Um, I love debating and 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 um, I know the brothers are going to do it with the dignity that is afforded a good debate. Um, so 
I think this question you know needs why? to be answered. Yes. Um, so we can be clear on going forward. You know why the base is good too, in another sense, is that remember back in the days, Professor, when you and your brothers, y'all had fights, and then you put the you put this on you and said, I dare you to knock that off his shoulder. I'm knock sorry. his mother off the roof. <laughs> remember that? Then you got the instigator saying, Yeah, go ahead. I dare you to knock it off the roof. Like this this supposed to be the mother. And they said, knock his mother off the roof. I remember growing up at that time. Yeah. You see? But, no. but what the debates do is you got these little going back and forth. All right, we want to put you in the ring and settle it like that. Y'all don't have to go no, out and get guns. It, don't call it a ring. And right, see, right. They yeah. should have never gone out and got guns for settled issues of, of history and social um, information in the first place. Um, we debated, you know, in my generation. Um, but at the end of the debate, it was two brothers or two sisters or brother and sister having a debate, not enemies. Uh -huh. And we were trying to debate so we can get the best of the information that the larger group of our people could use to go forward. And that's the way we got to look. Remember when I first came, came to you and we had the meeting with a um, um, uh, brother from Zulu Nation, you, myself, mm -hmm. um, Ali, um and what's the other brother's name was that um was it polite yes polite we're right we're, we're, at, we're. at the national black theater in the living room in the back we made a piece where we were talking about how a debate should be run and the kind of integrity right. right and principle you should bring to the debate right so i've even watched the debates that you do change turn a corner Mm -hmm. In the beginning, I thought you were the craziest Negro in New York. <laughs> like, What's wrong with this boy? So that's why I had to come and hang right. around and see. Okay, let me see if I can have some. I'm glad for your wisdom thing. too. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. We got better as we go along. Debating is a tool, and you have a new technologies or multiple technologies today that we didn't have, like what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. This is taking advantage of a technology my generation didn't really have. And you got uh, 907 people watching you right now without even promoting. Well, God bless them. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. So, but this debate on the matter nature is important because in Africa, let me tell you some things that I, I think I can say without directly influencing the debate. If you went to the Yoruba people of Nigeria, they say they're from Kemet. Mm -hmm. They say the Yor Yoruba spiritual tradition, cultural tradition, is the same tradition in Kemet. The only difference is, is the linguistic changes in sound. And they even say that most of the language of the Yoruba is Medoneta. If you went to Togo, the Ewe people are in Togo. They said they came to Togo from Kemet. They go further and said they represent Kemetan royalty and that they brought the throne, one of the major thrones from Kemet, to Togo. They brought the what? The throne, a throne. Uh -huh. The throne of the Pharaoh is in the mountains of Togo. And they said the language that they speak is Medonetje. Mm. So that you have people is. today that lives that speak Medonetje, you say? Yeah. All right. Okay. If you went to the Ga people of Ghana, on their fishing boats, they got carved Osiris and Kephra as their chief gods. And they said they're Nubians. Mm -hmm. So many of us in North America, now all those names I just mentioned belong to the same genetic cluster. They're culturally different, but genetically they're the same group of people. Most of us in North America is at least 75% what they call Yoruba. But if it's 75% Yoruba, that means Akan, Ewe, Ga, Ada, because all of them are the same genetic cluster. So when we begin to understand and, and do our own historical research, and the research I'm mentioning now come from Africans studying Africans, then we can begin to see that we have more going on than we think. And so when we look at the Metonetia, what we are learning from the Nile Valley, and now learning how to read it, at least reading whatever aspects of it we can, we are looking at a civilization who left this record. But when we get up in the morning and put on our clothes, we are the people of that civilization who made those records. Now, when we get there, we're going to be a bad man of mm -hmm. understand? When we get there and understand that we are the people of Kenya. 
and especially in North America. That's why we are browner than most other Africans in the hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Because by the time the British got into the system in the 1500s and the 1600s, and really take over at the beginning of the 1700s, starting in the 10th century, the Turks who took over the Islamic system went into ethnic cleansing and pushed millions of us out of the Nile Valley. Most of us end up in West Africa as new refugees. And so mm -hmm. if you had to capture somebody and sell them into slavery to save yourself and your people, you went to the refugee camp. Do you think? Do you hear what I just said? Yes, yes. So you understand Because look that. at the time. I don't oh, want yeah, you to get I'm a getting, ticket. We, we got, I'm looking got, at your, yeah, I'm looking got, at the got, clock. We got 14 So minutes. I want to ask you this real quick. No, you want to go down before yeah, on the yeah. clock. No, so on. I want to ask you this real quick. Do you think we waste our time with our Hebrew Israelite brothers, or are no. they worthy no. of us trying to share this information? Because no. some of them ain't going to get it, but no, some of them not have not made a crossover. It. Right, but, but let's not condemn our Hebrew yes. Israelite brothers. Yeah. Some of my closest comrades have been my brothers and sisters in the Hebrew community and some of my best teachers. The Hebrew Israelite experience is just one small piece of a greater black experience. It is not the beginning, it is not the end, it is not the end all. It is one experience of a small group of black people in the Middle East, so-called Northeast Africa, at a particular time in history. What's wrong is when they try to say, this is all of it, this is our history, everybody's Hebrew history. Like, that's where people go awry. No, that, that is an experience that some black people had. At the same time they were having that experience, they were black people down in Sudan having another kind of experience. There were black people up in North Africa, Morocco, having another kind of experience. There were black people down in South Africa having another kind of experience and didn't even know they existed in the Hebrew community having that experience. So all of these are experiences that our people, greater people had. And so if we study our history, and, and what is surprising, if you study the Torah, it will tell you the story. I don't understand why people for dogma's sake won't tell the whole truth of what is in the document the ancestors left. Because if you read the document the ancestors left, it'll tell quite a different story from the proselytizing dogmatic religious people are telling. But I'll leave it at that. I love my Hebrew Israelite brothers and sisters. Um, it's about learning and enlightening yourself and growing. <coughs> Same thing with my Muslim brothers and sisters. There's a book, again, I like the name books, there's a book called Jahiz, J-A-H-E-Z-Z, -E I think. Jahiz, El Jahiz, or Jahiz by Jahiz. You can get it at Barnes & Noble. If you try to get it online, it's gonna cost <coughs> hundreds of dollars. <coughs> in this book, written in Iraq, in the eighth century AD, eighth century AD, this black Iraqi is writing a book about the history of Prophet Muhammad. And he tells us that Prophet Muhammad was black. And he tells us that all the companion around the Prophet is black. Remember, he's writing in the eighth century, a century and a half after the death of the Prophet, or less than a century and a half. And so we need to go back and read that literature. One of his books, of the, there's nine books in that volume, small books. Today we would call them extended essays, but then they call them books. One of them is called the superiority of the black race over the white. That's the eighth century Iraq. Mm. <coughs> you have some water, brother. Yes. And and when we understand that, when you read that book, you go, damn, in the eighth century, we were dealing with the same issues of this crazy ass white man that we are dealing with today. <coughs> and so if we study the history we'll learn how those brothers dealt with it and solve some of the problems with it. But again, Islam isn't the beginning, it isn't the end. It isn't the perfection, it isn't even the best of what we have. It is just one of the experiences as black people we have. Mm -hmm. So we got 10 more minutes, brother. What I would like for you to do is take the time out to close out. You have 950 people watching you, 950 people. Talk to your people out there who love you, because we don't get this many people through the, through the you know, like that. Even that they here because they see your name in the title, yes. and they love you, brother. Well, I just like to tell my brothers and sisters I love them, too. You know, like one of the projects, I'm working on a project, and I'm always struggling with that project called the Sana Lodging Enterprise Limited. 
It's a 30-room hotel complex in West Africa, in Ghana, that me and some other brothers and sisters that bought it. It's not just me. So when are you going to take me to Africa first, with you, brother? I'll be heading on up 1st of March. <laughs> but let me just tell the people, there's 86 of us that put our little ducats together that raised a million dollars and bought this facility. 86 of us. And we managed to stay together without falling apart for 11 years. But we did get a lot, a heavy hit in 08 when the economy crashed. And we, we fought that back. We got hit in 10. But we got hit in the last three years of that Ebola. And we're struggling back. So if you want to send me $1 or 50 cents or 25 cents to help out with what we do at the sauna, because I do it out of my pocket and to make ends meet, me and Dr. Leonard Jeffries and a couple of others, brother Sedwick, sister Martha Ooh. Williams. And Martha Williams, my business partner, is, is a Hebrew Israelite whose daddy was Rabbi Poinsett. Mm. So I'm embedded in the Hebrew community too. Uh, but my email is C S M A L L. Hold on, please. Somebody put it in the chat room as he's saying it so they yeah. so the people could get it. Thank you, family. Go ahead, say it again. My email is C small C S M A L L 1926 at AOL.com. C S M A L L 1926 at AOL.com. Anything you can do to help the sound lives, just drop something into my PayPal. And I'll send it over there to make sure we meet salary. I'll send it over there to make sure that we take care. It's a magnificent place. Um, you can actually go online, sonalize.com, and get some glimpse of what we've got there. And this is something we built by the people. We ain't got no bank loan because no white bank in America was going to loan us anything. Right. <laughs> we were strangers in Africa, so no African bank was going to loan us. But we said, listen, if we could survive slavery, we could buy this hotel. So we put a little thousand dollars here, fifty thousand dollars there, twenty thousand dollars there. I, I and a few others were able to put a hundred thousand dollars up there. And in two years, we had a million dollars, and we bought it. And it has a big, major conference center. So if you came, the my idea was because I've seen people stranded in Africa and the U.S. embassy would have to try to send them back home. I wanted a place that's a safe haven for people from the diaspora who come home. And if you run out of money and you don't know no place to go, go and knock on the door at Sana Lodge. And we're going to feed you and we're going to give you a place to stay. Okay. And then we'll find a way to get you back home or find you work there if that's what you desire. Mm -hmm. If you want to come over with your organization and do a conference, we have a conference room that holds 175, one that holds 150, one that holds 100, and one that holds 50. So you can do your conference there. If you just want to come up with your family and hang out, we got a swimming pool, a pool bar, cocktail lounge, and restaurant. And we are walled in, we are villa, so we have our own enclosed parking lot. If you just want to come and hang out and have fun, so I, I'm off from work for three weeks, I'm going to hang out in Ghana for a week. Come on down to the sauna and hang out with us. And if I'm not there, there are other comrades who will show you all of the historical things around. We're midway between Cape Coast Castle and Almina Castle. We're right off of the ocean by two blocks. We're in the middle of a suburb, a black suburb, surrounded by schools and neighborhood people who are friends and comrades. And it's just a beautiful place. Who are some of the people that came to visit you so far since you've been out there? Queen of Pua. Oh, okay. There. Goodness. Almost everybody from this side mm. have gone there. Um, what's the brother name? Um, Wycliffe John have been there. Um, what's our sister name that used to stay for Wycliffe? Um, um the the singer the female sister who um sang with the poobies oh um, um lauren hill lauren hill had been okay. by there so and and a lot of others um before he passed isaac hayes who was my buddy and me and isaac you know we hung out together heavy in ghana so isaac was there and and many brothers and sisters almost every one of the major travel group almost all the major travel group from america have been there. And mm -hmm. so um, come to the Sana Lodge, support us in any way you can. Um, All right, real and, quick. And Yo, he got to go. This is Dr. Issa. Real quick, yes. my brother, hurry up. You know Dr. Issa? Yes, hey, um, Professor Smiles, how you doing? I'm good, Doc. How you doing? I, I'm so proud of you, and I'm so proud of the progress of our, our genius here, um, Sarnetta. I tell people, Sarnetta is a genius, Sarnetta. right? And he's our top, and he's our he's our Ted Turner, right? All, all over and, the I, world. and I keep telling a lot of cats that 
that. They were like, oh, he does that. I said, no, nah, bro. But I'll start that and we're nothing. Because he understands media and he understands propaganda, yeah. right? And I'm so proud to hear Sarnetta say, I've been begging Sarnetta to come to the continent with me, but he said he wants I'm, to go I'm with you, and I'm down. proud of that. I'm going to bring him now. down. we gone in March, and we gone in the summer, 24th July. And this is another thing. Um, you can um, email me to that number if you want to find out about our trip, and just send me your emails, um, brothers and sisters. We're, we got a trip going from March 1st to March um March 1st to March 11th to celebrate the 60th anniversary of Ghana independence. And then we've got another trip going the 24th of July to the um, the 4th of August. And that's going to be fantastic. We're going to Benin, Togo, Ghana with a one day stop. Um, in I'm scared of that Ebola, man. Well, I'm scared of America. That's why I'm getting my mind trying to be up there with Ebola and be here. But I'm going to have to leave you because I'm double parked. And I need to go and pick up my other baby grand. Y'all always hear me talking about my grandbaby. That's right. That's my world. Yeah, you love them. So and that's what's up. out of school early. Yeah, and so you got to go, brother. I don't want to. I don't want you to get no ticket. Run downstairs and get my. All right, he got to go, um, Issa, because Let me tell of who I voted for in the presidential election. Yeah, I voted for my granddaughter. I wrote her name in, and she was with me. She always go with me to vote. She's seven years old, so I voted for her for president. I didn't vote for none of those other two knuckleheads. And she got back home. She said, Grandpa, I don't want to be the president. And she was crying. I said, Baby, why don't you want to be president? He said, because that means I have to stand up and speak in front of all of those people. And I don't want to speak in front of all of those people. <laughs> I told my little baby, don't worry, baby. We need more votes than Grandpa both for you to win. But you already won. You're the president. And you go down in history knowing that your grandpa ran you for president of the United States when you were seven years old. But thank you, brothers and sisters, for tuning in. I wish I had more time. Come on, brother. We you, need you, to come you're back. pushing it. Yes, sir. You got so two need, minutes to get downstairs. We need to come back, and I'm going to do another piece. If you want me to go downstairs and come back, I can do that too. Once about to come. No, I ain't going to do that to you. Okay, we'll do it another day. Yes. But but just 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 tune in. Send me your email. Let me send you the info about the Ghana trips. And I love you because you're me. You're brother, me you are me. Brother, you are relentless, and you keep this going. Listen, and I love you, brother Smalls. And uh, Professor Smalls, yes. and um, yo, go take care of that. You got two minutes to get downstairs. And I'm home. They watching. I know. And family, everybody that's watching, I mean, come right back within another 10 minutes. I got Born Mastermind Allah. He will be in the building. Born Mastermind Allah will be here in the building. And um, I got more to make for you. I gotta make you some more. Okay, it's, yes, it's being made now, but I'm gonna have some ready for you. Right. So we got born master mind a lot. Oh, give me that. Give me that clip on you. The clip oh, on. Yeah, yeah. We getting ready to walk home with my with my sound piece, brother. <laughs> All right. Thank you, my brother. Okay, my Appreciate brother. you. Love you. Yeah, peace and blessings. And, um, love you too. And I'll give you a ring. Okay, I got more. I got more being made for you as we speak. Okay. See, look, look right there in the pedal. You see it being made. So I got more for you coming. Right. So family, as you see, um, we got Born Master Mind Allah. He will be here with his science. So come back about another, I would say maybe 15 minutes, 10 minutes, you know. Who knows? So how did y'all like that, family? How did y'all like that? I think Smalls, so far, was the best. He gave it up the best. I think Smalls gave it up the best so far. And uh, I don't know. Uh oh, that might be that might be my brother. Let me see. Yeah, who is it? Born Master is in the building early. He made it. Born Master Mind Allah is here in the building. Smalls woke me up this morning and shit. You know. I think that was a bomb. I'm, I'm going to end this stream right now because I don't want to mess it up. 
So we're going to end this stream. And, and uh, brothers, check this out. I'm coming right back in 10 minutes. I'm going to set Born Master Mind of Law up, and we're going to go live. He's going to show PowerPoint. Keep your ass in the building. Don't go nowhere. Peace and black power, family. We out.